Like at the end of the day, like they always say, most millionaires make their first million at 40. Yeah. He was getting ours when he was 19. So we ain't got no excuses not to take this thing to yeah. the next level. When he came to the league in the late 90s, he was fresh out of high school as a big man entering an NBA where the big man was expected to play a certain way. But that's not who Al Harrington was. He was six foot nine with an outside shot and could handle the ball on the perimeter. He could play the three through the five if you needed, but his ideal position never really seemed to be figured out during his 16 year career. His footwork down low or up top was impressive for a player his size, and his ability to stretch the floor and hit from range was valuable but underutilized for most of his career. He was a good power forward on a team with a great power forward during his early years in Indiana, so he became one of the best and most versatile sixth men in the league during that time. He would later play a huge role on the We Believe Warriors, then return to being one of the league's top sixth men late in his career. And while a knee injury derailed his final years, he has spent his post-NBA days becoming a business mogul. And while Al Harrington didn't have a Kobe or KG level playing career, he is still one of the better players to ever make the prep to pros jump. Yet you rarely hear his name come up when talking about those guys. And while he may not have been an all-timer, he was far from a bust. Let's jog your memory. A New Jersey native, Al Harrington's first time playing organized basketball came as a freshman at Roselle High School, mostly due to him being 6'4 at the time. But then during the summer AAU circuit, while Harrington was playing with the Roadrunners, he would be noticed by a few different coaches and was planning to go to St. Anthony's, but it was too far. So instead he went to St. Patrick's High School in Elizabeth, New Jersey, due to him only needing to take two buses each day to get there. So Harrington went from barely playing as a freshman at Roselle to starting on a team that featured All-American Shaheen Holloway as a sophomore at St. Patrick's. And Harrington improved quickly, attending the ABCD camp during summer after his sophomore year. But it was during a tournament in South Jersey where a now junior Harrington entered the national spotlight when he got the best of top-ranked senior Lamar Odom, as he would see his own name shoot up the rankings after this, and he would continue to up his stock in the All-American camp over the summer. Then by his senior season, he was considered by many as the nation's top player, and as a senior, he would average 21.9 points and 10.7 rebounds per game, while ultimately leading St. Patrick's to win the state tournament of champions as he would wrap up his senior year as a first-team Parade All-American and a McDonald's All-American, as well as winning a multitude of Player of the Year awards. So as the top player in the nation, Harrington had many schools coming after him, and would say on the Knuckleheads podcast that he would have committed to Georgia Tech. But then he got more intriguing news, with that being that he was projected to go top 15 in the upcoming draft. And while others said top 20, it was still a first round selection, with Harrington being looked at as a player who had the base, but just needed time to develop it. So in mid-May, he would declare for the 98 NBA draft. With the 25th pick of the 1998 NBA draft, the Indiana Pacers select Al Harrington from St. Patrick's High School in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Harrington fell a little further than the top 20, but he was still a first round pick being selected by an Indiana Pacers team who had fallen one win short of an NBA Finals appearance last year. And with the lockout occurring over the offseason, Harrington had plenty of time to acclimate and prepare for the demands of professional basketball. However, with Harrington turning 18 just a few months prior to the draft, it would be a while before he got a real shot in the big leagues. While Harrington would rarely see the court, he was in a great situation to learn the ins and outs of the game. On an experienced Pacers team coached by Larry Bird, and featuring guys like Reggie Miller, Mark Jackson, and Jalen Rose. And Harrington would spend his rookie season living with Antonio Davis, as he would explain on the Knuckleheads podcast that as soon as the lockout ended, Reggie Miller called the whole team to Indiana to start preparing, as they had lost Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals to a Michael Jordan-led Bulls team last year. And with Jordan retiring, Miller felt like this was Indiana's year. However, practice was mostly the only time Harrington would see the floor as a rookie as he would appear in just 19 games for the team, averaging less than 8 minutes in those games, with those minutes always coming in garbage time. But the Pacers were great, finishing at 33-17 as the two-seed in the East. However, Harrington was not a part of the playoff roster, as he would watch from the sidelines while his team swept Milwaukee in Round 1, then did the same to the Sixers in Round 2. But they met their match in a Cinderella New York Knicks team, who would knock them off in 6 in the Conference Finals. 
as Harrington's rookie year had seen him average about two points and two rebounds per game. Harrington would see his opportunity rise throughout the 2000 season, yet he still occupied one of the smallest roles on the team. However, a full 82-game schedule would lead to Harrington appearing in 50 games and getting over double the minutes from last year, at about 17 a game. And he looked like a seasoned pro over his first nine games of the year, as he was getting great minutes and producing. But this was also due to forwards Derek McKee and Chris Mullen struggling with injury. And then Harrington went down for about a month in late January, and when he came back, he couldn't find his way back into the rotation for a Pacers team who finished at 56-26 and 26 as the top seed in the East. Yet once again, Harrington would be left off of the playoff roster. For the second straight year, Indiana would beat Milwaukee in round one, yet this time it would take them five games. Then round two would again see them knock off Philly. However, this time it would take them six games. But even though they hadn't rammed through the first two rounds like last year, a conference finals rematch with New York would go in their favor, as they won in six but they met the early stages of a Lakers dynasty in the finals, and unfortunately fell in six games. As Harrington's second season ended, with him averaging about six and a half points, three rebounds, and one assist per game. But after the season, Bird retired, and with another Hall of Famer as his coach going forward, Harrington would finally get his chance in year three. The Pacers were looking to go younger in 2001, as they had already acquired Jonathan Bender in a trade with Toronto after last season, and now had seen Rick Smiths retire and Mark Jackson walk in free agency. And they had traded Dale Davis. But in return, they got another big man straight out of high school in the fifth year Jermaine O'Neal. And while this acquisition ruined any chance of Harrington being the team's starting power forward, new head coach Isaiah Thomas would still make sure to get him involved. And while he may not have had a defined position, he also showed his versatility, as throughout the year he would split time at the four and the three, and could even give some center minutes if the team absolutely needed. He would get significantly more minutes per game and be a regular part of the rotation as a sixth man and at times a starter. His minutes were up to over 24 a night, and while his scoring didn't change much from last year, the Pacers as a whole were not the high-scoring team they had been under Bird. But Harrington was showing his offensive ability as someone who could hit it from range, but also put the ball on the floor and attack, as he would hit double figures in 28 games, including three games with at least 20 and eight double-doubles. Unfortunately, with a new coach and so many new faces, the Pacers took a big step back, as they would only manage a 41-41 record, which would barely get them a playoff berth, as they secured the East's final spot. But a Sixers team led by MVP Allen Iverson would beat them in a gentleman's sweep. And even though Harrington finally got to experience the postseason, he didn't have much of an impact, and only appeared in three of the four games, as his year ended with him averaging about seven and a half points, five rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. But while this year had seen him get opportunity, next year would see him break out. Reggie Miller was aging, but O'Neal was becoming a star, and the team had added rookie point guard Jamal Tinsley. And while Thomas had been experimenting last year between Harrington being a starter or a sixth man, he decided that having Harrington come off the bench was the better decision, as it gave Thomas a lot more freedom in his lineups and gave the Pacers a guaranteed mismatch on offense. Over the first half of the season, Harrington was one of the league's premier sixth men, as he was now getting nearly 30 minutes a game and putting up career highs across the board. And the Pacers had fought out to a 22 and 21 record after 43 games, with Harrington having hit double figures in 30 of those, along with five double doubles. But in their 44th game versus Boston on January 23rd, Harrington went down with a torn ACL, which would end his season, which was especially unfortunate, as less than a month later, the Pacers made a big move that saw them acquire both Ron Artest and Brad Miller from Chicago. As overall, the Pacers would finish the year at 42-40, and 40, but would lose to New Jersey in the first round of the playoffs, with Harrington's half-season seeing him average about 13 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. But with a full season of Artest and Miller, and Harrington returning healthy, the 3 season was looking like an opportunity for the Pacers to make their return among the best in the East. A 37-year-old Reggie Miller would take a backseat to the younger guys in 03, as O'Neal, Artest, and Brad Miller became one of the league's best young trios. But Harrington's season can't be undersold. After suffering a late January ACL tear, he came back in 03 as the only player on the team to play in all 82 games, and he didn't look to be feeling many negative effects. He would even start his first 10 games of the season as Reggie Miller sat out the first 12 with ankle issues, and in that time, Harrington played solid and the Pacers were 10-2, and 
before Harrington returned to the bench after Miller came back and spent the majority of the remaining games in that role, and overall would hit double figures in 47 games, along with 10 double-doubles, and would even explode for 40 points on 60% shooting in a December 23rd defeat of Atlanta. And with Harrington playing a full season, he was eligible for end-of-season awards, as he would finish top 10 in 6th man of the year voting. The Pacers are one of the league's top teams after 52 games, as they were sitting at 37-15, and 15, but they would experience a bit of a collapse over the remaining 30, going just 11-19 and 19 the rest of the way, as they finished with a disappointing 48-34 and 34 record. However, it was still enough for the playoffs and a first-round matchup with Boston. Unfortunately for Harrington, he would go ice cold in this series, starting off by going 1-8 of eight in a Game 1 loss, and after this he would fail to hit a shot over the next two games. As for the entire series, he failed to reach double figures in any games and had just one game shooting above 25%, with his best performance coming in the Pacers' Game 5 win, when he had three steals and a block. However, the Celtics would win the series in six, with Harrington's most well-known moment of this series coming from him ending up on the wrong end of a Paul Pierce highlight. Harrington talking to Pierce. And Joe DeRosa telling him to shoot. Pierce. But overall, Harrington had a great year, which saw him average about 12 points, 6 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. But when the following season started, it became clear quickly that the Pacers were back to being contenders. Thomas was out, and Rick Carlisle was in, and Harrington would make a legit case for the league's top 6th man this season. He would put up career highs up to that point in scoring, rebounding, and steals, while also shooting over 46%, as he would even finish as a top 3 scorer on the team. And over the course of the season, he would record 55 games in double figures and 12 double-doubles. The Pacers featured one of the league's best defenses and were rolling out of the gate, as they got off to a 14-2 start, which included an 8-game win streak, then continued to string together win streaks throughout the season, and would end the season just as hot as they started it, by going 11-2 in their final 13, which included winning their final 5 games with Harrington playing great in those games, but he would come up just short of 6th man of the year, finishing 2nd to Dallas's Antoine Jameson. But he and the Pacers were hot going into the playoffs, with a league-best 61-21 record, and a first-round rematch with Boston. Harrington would redeem himself in a big way, going for 14 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 steals in a Game 1 win, then putting up 12 points, 13 boards, and 3 steals in a Game 2 win. He went for 19-9 in Game 3 in Boston, then 13-7 with 3 steals in Game 4, as the Pacers pulled off the sweep and were moving on to face a young Miami Heat team. Harrington couldn't keep his hot streak going in Round 2, as he was averaging less than 8 points over the first two games. Yet the Pacers had won both. He would have his only game in double figures in Game 3, with 13 points and a loss, then the rest of the way he would average less than 7 points. But the Pacers were the better team, and would defeat Miami in six games, as they would make a return to the conference finals to take on Detroit. Harrington got back on track in Game 1, with 14 points, 8 rebounds, and 3 steals off the bench in a win, before being held scoreless in a Game 2 loss. He came back with 13 in Game 3, but after this, his shot just stopped falling, as he would shoot below 35% from the field for the remainder of the series, as Indiana came up short, losing in 6 with Harrington's year seeing him average about 13.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. But a welcome change was coming for Harrington over the offseason. While he had his success in a bench role, Harrington wanted to be a starter, but that didn't look to be happening anytime soon, with Artest and O'Neal firmly locked in as frontcourt starters. So he would tell team president Larry Bird that he would rather be traded than continue to come off the bench. And Bird would oblige as a sign-and-trade deal with Atlanta would see the Pacers receive Steven Jackson, with Harrington going to the Hawks. And while the Hawks were one of the league's worst teams last year, Harrington was happy and optimistic about his new team. The Hawks were going for a full overhaul, as a few weeks later they would package Jason Terry in a deal to Dallas, which saw them receive Antoine Walker in return. But outside of these two, and point guard Teron Liu, who they wouldn't acquire until a couple months into the season, the Hawks didn't have much. And while they had added rookies Josh Childress and Josh Smith, they were still in store for a rough season. Harrington had gotten his wish and was a full-time starter for the first time in his career. As in year 7, he was still just 25 years old, 
and would play a career-high 38.6 minutes per game, primarily at small forward, while also spending time at power forward, as one of the few consistent offensive options for the Hawks, as he would act as the team's second-leading scorer and rebounder, while leading the team in steals. Harrington would hit double figures in 60 games, while recording 12 double-doubles. But the Hawks had found a way to take a huge step back from their 28 wins last year, as they featured a bottom three offense and defense this year, and would lose most of their scoring after trading Walker to the Celtics at the deadline. But it didn't really matter, because at that point they were 10-43, and, and in the midst of what would become a 13-game losing streak. Then after a March 11th win versus Toronto, which saw Harrington drop 28 points, the Hawks would go on to lose their next 14, as from February 2nd to April 8th, they went 1-27, and, and ultimately would end the season with a league-worst 13-69 record, with Harrington's first year in Atlanta seeing him average about 17.5 points, 7 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. The Hawks held the second pick in the draft, and would take North Carolina forward Marvin Williams, with the two players coming off the board after him being Chris Paul and Darren Williams. But they would do their best to make up for that, by trading for Phoenix Suns shooting guard Joe Johnson, as the 06 season would see the Hawks feature one player over 28 years old, with a duo of Johnson and Harrington looking like it could have some potential. Harrington remained in his starting role, playing mostly at the three again, due to the emergence of Josh Smith. Johnson quickly became option number one, but a healthier year from Harrington saw him turn in the best season of his career up to that point, finishing second on the team with a then career-high scoring average while shooting over 45% from the field, and also finishing second on the team in rebounding and assists. So while Harrington was able to utilize his speed and size to create mismatches depending on who was guarding him, something that really became a prominent part of his game this season was the deep ball, as after taking 246 threes over his first seven seasons, he would take 194 in this season alone, while making nearly 35% of them. But while he had never looked better offensively, his defense wasn't at the same level, as his 301 personal fouls would lead the NBA. Nonetheless, he was still one of the Hawks' best players, hitting double figures in 70 games, which included 4 games with at least 30 and 12 double-doubles. But it felt all too familiar in Atlanta, as they began the season with 9 straight losses, then after 2 wins, they lost 7 more. They wouldn't fall as far as they did last year, as their offense was improved, and over the rest of the season, they wouldn't have any more horrible stretches like that. But they would lose 13 of their final 17 to finish the year at 26 and 56, and again miss the playoffs, as Harrington's year had seen him average about 18 and a half points, 7 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. But Harrington would be back in a familiar place to begin the following season, but it was complicated getting there. Harrington was a free agent yet reportedly teams weren't willing to pay him outright what he wanted, yet they were still interested in his services, if Atlanta were to cover some of the cap hit. And with Atlanta wanting to acquire future assets, they seemed willing to do that. And Indiana just happened to have a trade exception that they had received when acquiring Peja Stojakovic during last season, which made bringing Harrington back to Indiana a very plausible option. But Hawks GM Billy Knight tried to add a couple unexpected stipulations into the deal, leading to Indiana calling off the trade altogether and Harrington firing his agent, as it didn't look like he was going to be getting the nearly $60 million deal he was expecting. But after about a month of back and forth, a sign-in trade was agreed upon, as Harrington got about $36 million over four years and was heading back to Indiana. Indiana looked different from Harrington's last time there, as although there were still familiar faces like Tinsley and O'Neal, there were also new guys like Danny Granger and the player Harrington was traded for in Steven Jackson. And one player missing was Ron Artest, who had been traded last season after being reinstated due to a suspension after his role in the Malice at the Palace, as the Pacers were still working on rebuilding their image. Harrington's second stint in Indiana would see him as a starter, playing both the three and the four. And while Harrington was acting as the team's second leading scorer, on a lights out 45.8% from beyond the arc, an Indiana team who played at one of the league's faster paces just weren't scoring, and the image of the Pacers was still looming over the organization's head. And with Steven Jackson being involved in his shooting prior to the season, the Pacers had been looking for ways to move on from him. And after a disappointing 20-18 start, Indiana found a trade partner for Jackson in the Golden State Warriors. But the Warriors had also reportedly been one of the frontrunners to acquire Harrington over the offseason before Indiana got him, and with the Pacers wanting to get rid of Jackson, they were willing to add Harrington to the deal, as he was heading to a feisty team in Golden State. 
Harrington and Jackson joined Baron Davis, Jason Richardson, and Monte Ellis in Don Nelson's run-and-gun offense. And this was an offense that really benefited from Harrington's skill set, as he could finally start a power forward, as well as play some center, but play the positions in an untraditional way, as more of a stretch four, as after averaging a career-high 3.3 attempts from beyond the arc over his first 36 games in Indiana, he upped that to 4.2 over the remainder of the season with Golden State, as overall he would drain 127 three-pointers in this season alone, after making a combined 126 over his first eight years. The Warriors were 19-20 and 20 at the time of the trade, and the addition of Jackson and Harrington were giving them about 38 extra points per game, as Harrington upped his scoring to 17 a game, and ended the season as the team's second leading scorer behind only Baron Davis. And the Warriors were one of the league's most exciting teams, with one of its most high-powered offenses. And although they didn't play any defense, they would still manage to go 23-20 post-trade to finish with a 42-40 record, which was enough for the 8th seed in a first-round playoff matchup with the heavily favored Dallas Mavericks. But the Warriors believed they could win. Harrington wouldn't have a great series offensively, as he shot 3 of 14 from the field in Game 1, yet the Warriors pulled out a double-digit win. Dallas evened it in Game 2, with Harrington continuing the struggle, going 1 of 8 from the field leading to Nelson taking him out of the starting lineup going into Game 3. Harrington would play just 14 minutes and take 3 shots in another Warriors win, and over the next 3 games he would see his minutes decrease, leading to a scoreless Game 6. But the Warriors would win that game, marking their 4th win of the series, as they had upset the top-seeded Dallas Mavericks and were moving on to a second round matchup with Utah, and Harrington looked like a whole different player. He continued coming off the bench, but would drop 21 points on over 58% shooting while hitting 4 shots from deep in a close Game 1 loss. Then over the next two, he would average 16 points along with a steal and a block, with the team splitting those. Game 4 in Golden State saw Harrington drop a postseason career-high 24 points with 4 threes before fouling out in another loss. Then after just 8 points in Game 5, Utah wrapped up the series and ended the Warriors' We Believe run with Harrington's full year seeing him average about 16.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The Warriors decided to run it back for the 08 season, as they would have Jackson and Harrington from the beginning. Harrington had been primarily the team's starter throughout the first 47 games, and continued to give them good scoring and floor spacing, as he was taking 5.5 threes per game. But in early February, the team welcomed the newly signed Chris Webber, and Harrington saw Webber take his spot. This didn't last long as Weber managed 9 games, then retired, but even after this, Harrington saw a slightly diminished role, and overall had seen himself confined to more of a 3-point specialist this season. He would still hit double figures in 59 games, with 7 double-doubles, while erupting for 38 points in a November 3rd loss to Utah. But overall he wasn't being used like he had been over the second half of last season, and would turn in the lowest numbers of his career since his first stint in Indiana. And while the Warriors played their same brand of basketball, and improved to a 48-34 record, this wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth in a competitive Western Conference, as Harrington's year ended with him averaging about 13.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. Harrington was again a warrior to begin the season, but he didn't want to be, as he had publicly requested a trade prior to the season after wanting out for a while, and he got his wish, as with Monte Ellis missing extended time, the Warriors needed to replace that loss of wing scoring. And they would, when they acquired Jamal Crawford from New York, by sending Harrington to the Knicks in late November. The same day the Knicks traded Crawford, they also traded Zach Randolph, so Harrington was coming into a new situation as a player with expectations on him. The Knicks had good pieces, from young guys like Nate Robinson and David Lee, to other veterans like Quinn Richardson and Tim Thomas. But looking at their roster, their best offensive player was arguably Harrington, and luckily for them, he would play like that. Harrington would start for the majority of the season and act as one of the league's best stretch fours this year. And he would record career highs in attempted and made threes, with his 171 made three-pointers being a top 10 mark in the league. But he did a bit of everything, as although he was entering his 11th year in the league, he still started the season at just 28 years old. So physically he was in his prime, with the quickness to face up and blow past people in the post, or take them off the dribble from the perimeter. And for the first time in his career, he would lead his team in scoring on a career-high average, while also finishing second on the team in rebounding. The Knicks were coached by Mike D'Antoni, which meant they would play at a fast pace. 
and this translated to some big scoring nights for Harrington, as in just his third game with the team, he dropped 36 points. Then a couple weeks later, he went for 39, as overall he would record double figures in 68 games with 10 double-doubles. But the Knicks as a whole were one of the worst shooting teams in the NBA, while also featuring its worst defense, as they would finish with just a 32-50 record and miss the playoffs, with Harrington's season seeing him average about 20 points, 6 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. Harrington was still a Nick going into the 2010 season, and the Knicks would get great play from young players like Wilson Chandler and Danilo Gallinari. David Lee would surpass Harrington as the team's best player, and once again Harrington found himself in a situation where the best player on the team played the same position as him, so he would return to the bench as a sixth man. But after so much back and forth between starting and coming off the bench throughout his career, this season showed that he may be best suited as a premier second unit guy, as although his minutes dropped, and his numbers dropped, he was still acting as the team's second leading scorer and rebounder, and in just his third game of the season, and his first of the year coming off the bench, he would drop a career-high 42 points on 16 of 23 shooting, with only one made three, in a loss to Philly, as that would be one of two 40-point games off the bench for him this season, as he would put up 41 points and 10 rebounds in a loss to Denver less than a month later, and overall would hit double figures in 60 games with six double-doubles. But the Knicks continued playing little defense while scoring three less points a night than last year, leading to a 29-53 finish and again no playoff berth, as Harrington's year ended with him averaging about 17.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. But for the first time in his career, Harrington was set to have full freedom in free agency. In mid-July, Harrington announced that he had signed with the Denver Nuggets, with Dallas reportedly also making a big push for the versatile forward but he would ultimately sign a five-year deal with a Nuggets team who at the time were led by Carmelo Anthony and Chauncey Billups. And Denver was likely very thankful they signed Harrington, as both Kenyon Martin and Chris Anderson would miss at least 34 games this year. But even with the thin front court, Harrington remained as a sixth man. He was giving the team good minutes and production leading up to the trade deadline, and the Nuggets were sitting at a solid 33-25 and on February 22nd. But then a blockbuster trade occurred, which saw Anthony and Billups get sent to New York, with Denver receiving a huge return package. So with the Nuggets having many more capable young players after the trade, Harrington would see his role decrease over the remainder of the season. Yet although Denver had lost their top players, they made it work, and still finished with a 50-32 record, and got a first-round matchup with OKC. Harrington wouldn't get a lot of opportunity in this series, as aside from dropping 15 points in about 25 minutes in Game 2, he would fail to score more than 5 points in any other game, while only having one more appearance of at least 16 minutes. But Harrington was getting older, and couldn't move as quick as the young Thunder Stars, as OKC wrapped up the series in 5, with Harrington's season ending with him averaging about 10.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. But with a full offseason for George Carl to figure out lineups, Harrington bounced back in a big way in 2012. When the team came back from the lockout, Harrington was still penciled in as the sixth man, but now had a bigger role, as he would receive nearly five more minutes per game while taking three more shots, yet shooting more efficiently from the field overall. With young guys like Ty Lawson and Aaron Aflalo leading the team, a 14th year Harrington was a great presence off the bench, as he would hit double figures in 53 of his 64 games played, as well as nine double-doubles. With his second unit offense and ability to space the floor, being a huge reason for the Nuggets being the league's highest scoring team this year. And although defense was not a concern for the team, they would still finish with a 38-28 record and a first-round matchup with the Lakers, with Harrington finishing top five in sixth man of the year voting as well. Harrington had really showed just how bad he wanted it, as he had played his final 12 games of the season on a torn meniscus to help the Nuggets make their playoff push. Then after scoring double figures in each of the first two games of their series, an Andrew Bynum elbow would break Harrington's nose in Game 3, yet he was back with a mask in Game 4. But over his next three, he struggled, averaging about 5 points while shooting a combined 5 for 26 from the field. But the Nuggets had come back from down 3-1 to force a Game 7, and although Harrington had one of the best performances of his career, with 24 points off the bench, the Lakers still got the win to end Denver's season, with Harrington's year seeing him average about 14 points, 6 rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. But playing on that injured knee turned out to be detrimental for the rest of Harrington's career. 
In the offseason, Harrington was included as part of the deal that sent Dwight Howard to Los Angeles, as Harrington would end up in Orlando, but there was little focus on basketball for Harrington. Shortly after his playoff exit, he underwent surgery to repair his knee, but he would develop a staph infection soon after, as well as need three more surgeries, which led to him needing around-the-clock care, as he recovered from it all. He would persevere and make his Magic debut on February 26th, then about a week later would score a season-high 10 points in a win over New Orleans, but after appearing in a total of 10 games, he fell out of the rotation, never again playing for the team, as they finished with a 20-62 record and missed the playoffs. With Harrington's brief year seeing him average about 5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. After the season, Harrington and the Magic would agree on a release so he could seek a contract with a better team, and he would sign on with a young Wizards team featuring John Wall and Bradley Beal. And while it was better than last season, it wasn't a smooth ride, as after appearing in the team's first 7 games, another knee surgery would shut him down until late February. But he would return to play 27 games to end the year, even scoring a season-high 16 points versus Miami in the second last game of the season, as the Wizards finished with a 44-38 record and got a first-round matchup with Chicago. Harrington's role was limited, seeing the court in three of the five games and failing to record any points, but Washington won to take on Indiana in round two. Harrington would have a larger role in this series, even scoring 11 points off the bench in a game four loss. But after winning game one, Washington would lose in six as Harrington's season ended with him averaging about 6.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and an assist per game. With so many concerns around his knee, Harrington wasn't able to find a team to latch onto for the 2015 season, at least not in the NBA, as he would go overseas and sign with the CBA, but he would only be there a few months before returning to the US in hopes that he could sign on with an NBA team for the rest of the 2015 season. But when that didn't happen, he would officially announce his retirement in March. But then in October, he was back on the court, this time in the NBL, for the Sydney Kings, as an injury replacement for former Hawks teammate Josh Childress, where he would play 6 games and average nearly 18 points. His last stint playing organized basketball came in Ice Cube's Big 3 League, where he joined the trilogy for the league's inaugural season, leading them to an undefeated 10-0 record and the championship. But it's what Al Harrington has done since his encore career ended, which will truly define his legacy. Harrington always had an entrepreneurial mind with the best interest of the consumer as priority. With Harrington debuting an affordable basketball sneaker in the late 2000s under the protege brand name. But post NBA, he got into the cannabis industry, telling a story on the Knuckleheads podcast of convincing his grandmother to try it for her glaucoma and her being pain free and able to read her Bible for the first time in years because of it, leading to him starting a cannabis company and naming it Biola after her, and as the years have gone on, Harrington has built his name in an industry that is predominantly white, with a secondary goal of helping to increase the number of black-owned companies in the industry, even creating a cannabis line with Allen Iverson in 2021. Then perhaps most impressive was in 2017, after sitting down and speaking with Harrington about the benefits of cannabis, former NBA commissioner David Stern would publicly say that he was convinced that marijuana should no longer be on the banned substance list. And in 2022, Harrington announced a partnership with the Players Association to promote his performance-based wellness and recovery line of cannabis products. With Harrington's success in this endeavor clearly being in large part due to his desire to help others with his product, as opposed to making money. And I feel like the impact, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to have will be bigger than anything I ever did in hoop. Al Harrington is probably the most forgotten prep to pro player at this point in time. His career rides a fine line when it comes to players straight out of high school, as he wasn't a bust like many of the others, but he wasn't a star like Kobe Bryant or Kevin Garnett. And it didn't help him that he was a tweener entering the league at a time when a big man was expected to play down low. Then by the time the league was changing, he was playing his final years. He was a great sixth man for the Pacers during their brief period of high-level play in the mid-2000s, then showed he could be a starter in Atlanta before acting as a great piece for the We Believe Warriors then put together a couple of his best years in New York. And then right when it looked like he had found a good situation in Denver to end his career, he messed up his knee and got traded away, and was never able to play anywhere near the level he was used to, but was eventually able to leave the game on his own terms. And even though Al Harrington's career is nothing to sneeze at, with the strides he's making in the cannabis world, his NBA career is going to take a backseat to his future accomplishments. But Al Harrington's NBA career was successful, 
and maybe would have been better in another era, but he is without a doubt a prep to pro success story. But that's it for today's episode on Al Harrington. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his early Indiana teammates or this one on one of his Wizards teammates. Thanks for watching and see you next time.